Hello and welcome to another episode of the PAVECast. My name is Ed Niedermeyer. I am the Communications Director here at Partners for Automated Vehicle Education. And we have a fascinating uh, topic for today's discussion um, about sensors, which we do talk about a lot here at, at PAVE, but um, this is perhaps a, a sensor that uh, listeners may not be quite as familiar with. Um, today, I am joined by Tariq Bullat, he is the uh, CEO and co-founder of GPR. Uh, Tariq, welcome. Hey, Ed, really nice to be here. And um, so, so you're the CEO and co-founder of, of GPR, which uh, stands for Ground Penetrating Radar, which is really the, the, the sensor technology that we're gonna to, to really try and uh, help folks understand here today. Um, I, I was wondering sort of, first of all, I mean, I think people understand radar, ground penetrating, these words are, are familiar to us. Uh, uh, but can we just start at the beginning of sort of like, why did you look at this technology? Why, why, why did you start a company to bring this technology to uh, uh, automated vehicles? Yeah, we would be happy to. So we started GPR really to fill some of the reliability gaps in positioning of autonomous vehicles. So you know, unlike traditional vehicles um, that have much coarser um, uh, positioning systems, for an automated ve autonomous vehicle um, or a passenger vehicle that has autonomous features on it, it needs to know exactly where it is. It's a centimeter level precision, and it needs to know that throughout the course of its automated journey, whether that's going around San Francisco or whether that's an automated feature on you know, I-40 or I-95 or what have you. Um, and that's really hard to do to that level of reliability. And so the sort of eureka moment at GPR uh, and really sort of the, the seed of, of the company um, was when we realized that you could use subsurface images uh, just as you would surface images. Uh, and in fact, that was a better way for doing positioning or what we call in the industry localization because those images were much richer in detail and they were stable over very, very long time periods. Two of the things that are hard to achieve on the surface um, are abundant uh, in the subsurface. Um, and so from there, we developed the product to, uh, uh, to be able to generate a pose or, or, or a position for a vehicle. Uh, and we've been off to the races in, in both the assisted driving world with some of the biggest OEMs as well as in the, the level four world. Yeah. And, and so um, localization for, for folks who are not you know, engineers in this space is a, a really big you know, issue in, in, in this technology. Um, we talk a lot about, about mapping and stuff, and we've done a number of of, of conversations and, and, and things about, about mapping. And, and you know, I think it's, it's easy to understand that if you use sensors to you know, uh, uh, have a model of the world that you know, you're sort of fundamentally creating a map of finding where you are in that map, uh, it, it sounds easy for us as people, uh, but, but, it, but it really isn't always. And, um, uh, and, and so sort of what you're talking about here, just to kind of really break it into simple English is being able to look underneath the ground in order to know where you are. Is that, is that the, the right way to kind of break that down? That's right, that's right. So the product itself is a radar that's designed in-house here at GPR that goes underneath the chassis. So not like your forward facing um, 77 gigahertz radars that you might be familiar with for things like adaptive cruise control. Totally different design, totally different frequency set importantly. Hmm. Um, and what that does is that allows you to image about 10 feet or three meters into the ground um, and then use those images to basically create a map or a fingerprint that you can then match to similarly to how you would um, with an HD map that's been built with LiDAR or camera. The, the shift in perspective that GPR has been driving is to move the paradigm away from just trying to replicate human cognition, which is sort of what an HD map on the surface is. You know, I see a tree, uh, you know, the tree by my house on, on the corner of, uh, of Peach Street. Uh, I see that and I know where I am on Peach Street. Um, uh, is how a human would, uh, you know, would, would drive its position and how, a, how an autonomous vehicle today would drive its position. We're saying you actually need to introduce new data sets, new data layers to make autonomous vehicles and autonomous features even safer than human drivers. And so that's what we've done by sort of rethinking the problem and saying, if you're building a built for purpose positioning solution, you know, where would you do that? What are the characteristics of that map you would look for? Um, and then let's go and build that. Yeah. Um, wow. So that, that's really cool. I, I love, I love the, the idea that we kind of had to start 
some of these problems by by replicating how humans do things, uh, and then sort of taking the next step to 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 thinking about you know how could a robot do it in a way that isn't dependent on on how we happen to do it as as humans, and and we're going to look um, you know a, a bit here at, at at some of the the returns that you get from from uh, ground penetrating radar to to kind of help people really see what what you're talking about here. But before we get into that. Um, you know, I wanted to just uh, quickly help people understand this, uh, just how the technology is working, because I think it'll help them understand what they're what they're seeing when we when we start to get into that. Um, the uh, so radar, right? I, I think is something that people are, are relatively familiar with. But but if you could maybe briefly just sort of, uh, you know, at a high level, sort of how does radar work, and then and then maybe sort of what is the difference between the traditional radar that you might use like you said, in a, a forward-facing radar for adaptive cruise control. Um, how, how, is, how does that technology need to be different in order to, to perform this, this ground penetrating function? Of course, yeah. So, you know, radars generally are uh, transmitting and receiving radio waves. Um, and in doing that, they are basically measuring things outside of the, uh, outside of the, the antenna. So just to give you a simple example, adaptive cruise control, um, you know, the speed of the vehicle and then the radar is determining how far away a vehicle in front of it is. And so if you're going too fast, <laughs> you know, if that distance is shortening, um, then you're able to, uh, to automatically break the vehicle. Um, and that's true, you know, if you think of other sort of um, more newfangled radars on the imaging side, like an imaging radar, uh, similarly, you know, emitting radio waves uh, to characterize an image, you know, it bounces back and you say, based on this information, um, this is what I think is out in the world. We're doing the same thing with ground penetrating radar, except we're doing it at a different frequency set, a much lower frequency set. Um, and what that means is that the wavelengths are longer and they're able to penetrate materials that would typically be reflective to um, higher frequency radar. So, you know, very simply, uh, we, you know, we're based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, we just had a, a snowstorm and then a deep freeze here. There's a bunch of ice on my radars on the front of my uh, my vehicle, uh, and that disabled the uh, the ADAS feature because the, the radar you know can't um, can't see so to speak through that. Um, that isn't an issue uh, for the frequency set that we're at. We're able to you know penetrate snow and ice um, uh, and water to a degree uh, and characterize the subsurface uh, as a result. So a similar approach. We're just measuring reflections off of things like changes in soil type or soil density, rebar, concrete, as opposed to other vehicles or, or things out on the surface. Right, right, and and because we again, as as humans, we're not able to look below the surface of the of the road uh, or or of the ground. You know, it, it it's not always obvious to us how inconsistent and sort of how there's a, a fingerprint right to 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 every kind of soil surface um, and 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 ground stratigraphy or whatever. I'm not, I'm not sure I even know the right term. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're, you, you, you've got it right. And, and it, you know, it, it surprises people to learn that even in things like bridges or parking garages, where you're really working with, you know, eight inches or 20 centimeters of, uh, of concrete, you're able to generate a unique signature um, and, uh, and, and then track to that. And so it's just a, a shift in the way of, of thinking about what the data can look like uh, and then how you can action that data for very practical purposes. Yeah. So perfect, perfect lead. And let's, let's look at some of this data, right? Let's, uh, let's uh, start to see what a, a ground penetrating radar looks, uh, sees when it, when it, when it looks below the, the surface of the road. So um, this first visual, um, it, it's hard for me to say, <laughs> what are we looking at here? Help me, help me out here. Yeah. So th this is a cross section of some of the radar data that we're generating. You might think of this as the GPR map. And so, um, you know, at the top, you can imagine there's sort of a, a plane at the top, which is the top of the road, and then you're seeing a cross section down into the road um, of the reflections that we're getting. And this is, you know, when we talk about the fingerprint, um, this is what it looks like. And, and then when you're doing localization, you're simply matching your current um, scan in that volume of, uh, of previous map. Um, and so that's what you're seeing here. You can, you can imagine if you if you dug your, if you had uh, radar vision, so to speak, uh, and you, uh, you know, you were sitting under the road, um, looking at what GPR was, was generating, this is what you'd see. Okay, and so and so the the different uh, like uh, sort of sizes of the of the returns that we're seeing here. So so is that showing different materials density? What you know? 
what's yeah, creating so it can these be differences. anything yeah so you know to, to get technical it's change in the dielectric properties but what that means in practice is you're seeing changes in soil type or soil density cavities roots rocks um, you don't actually need to classify those things although you can you can do you know feature extraction of them um, you just want to know that there's a, basically a unique image that you're then able to match to. Um, okay. And the beauty of this is that you're getting unique images, you know, all the way throughout, even if you're, say, in a tunnel, which is, you know, visually uniform to, on the surface, or a parking garage, which can be visually uniform on the surface. Um, and so it's just a very differentiated sort of point of view in a way. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so this is a really good, uh, you know, place to, to, to start thinking about, about what you're seeing here. But but and and this is you, you'll notice these images are are moving, but we're sort of only seeing the one the one cross section. So maybe um, we can look at, at sort of the next set of, of visuals here, which I think is it, this is showing sort of the road from above, so that so that these these differences in in the layers and the cross section that we just saw are being visualized in a in a kind of different way here. Uh, talk us through what we're seeing here. Yeah, so this is a bird's eye view. Uh, so this is sort of a summation of the reflections, you know, as seen from above. Uh, and what you can see here is that there's unique uh, imagery throughout uh, the length of the map. And so um, as you're driving across, uh, you know, a road, for instance, what you would expect to see is, you know, different uh, intensities for every, you know, inch of road that you drive upon. And if you were to zoom in here, even on, on some of the places that, you know, might look blue from, uh, from the current zoom angle, you would see that there's unique, uh, you know, colors there. Um, and what that corresponds to is the different intensities of reflection um, as, you, as you travel across the road. Yeah, so, so this, is, this is fascinating because, you know, uh, um, for most sort of AV uh, sensors and perception, um, when you're looking at, you know, features and, and, and as you know, sort of reference identifying features or, or things like that, they're, they're things that are, you know, you want to steer around, right, or 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 move towards or whatever, um, but this is this is different because this is almost more like uh, I, I think you used the analogy of a fingerprint earlier, it, right? Like like these differences themselves are not necessarily uh, you know things that that are that are obstacles for the system, but it's but talk us through sort of how how these are, are starting to help the, the system understand. Yeah, yeah, you know it's so interesting. We were just talking about uh, this with, with the customer, which is you know your first instinct is there's a feature like, where's the pipe? You know, where's the root? Can I see it? Uh, and of course, with the radar data, that's not how you think about it. It's more of a mathematical feature uh, than it is sort of a visual, uh, a visual feature. Um, and so, um, you know, very, very simply put, the reason that this set of imagery is so valuable for the vehicle is that it's rich in that data. It's quite simple in its richness in a way in that it looks different, uh, but you don't have to pull out features from it. Uh, and then you simply just correlate images as you drive along uh, and, uh, and find your match. And so it's, um, in a way, it's a simpler version of uh, feature-based localization because you don't have to do the, the feature extraction that you might have to do with a traditional HD map where you actually just want to pull, you know, identify the tree or the sign or the building, uh, what have you. Yeah, no, that's, that's really interesting. It, um, it, in a way, it almost, and, and I don't know if this is a, a great analogy, but it almost reminds me of like the, um, the what three words mapping thing where the words right. themselves, you know, don't mean anything. They're, they have nothing <laughs> right. to do with the place, but it's just a way to know that that's a unique place, right? It's that's like, right. Yeah. Huh. That's, that's really, really interesting. Um, uh, uh, so, so, you know, at the system level, you know, are, uh, is the first image that we saw sort of more what the, the kind of data the system is using and that, or, or is this overhead image also sort of oh, the way the system is 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 getting useful information out of uh, out of these returns? Or yeah, it's it's a, it's a great uh, it's a great question. You know, they, they both actually reflect the same data just from different perspectives in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we're running our algorithms, um, we are looking at that imagery data um, and saying, okay, you know, what is the correlation like? And the reason that that you know, works so well, especially where the current gaps in, in ADAS and in AV are, is that that imagery that you saw is static over long time periods. And so it could be snowing, you could have a very busy urban scene, um, you, you know, a, uh, an Amazon truck may pull alongside you and block the field of view. 
none of that is going to alter what the fingerprint or the map under the road looks like. Um, and so you've got a very, very robust static uh, data set that doesn't need a high level of maintenance. Um, and so that's what, the, that's what those images are. You know, at the end of the day, they're stable, differentiated images um, that you can use to, to generate a photo. And, and so this could be like a, a layer that you would just have and, and potentially even integrate into a, a, another HD map, or is it more of a standard? Exactly thing? right. Exactly right. So with like the level four companies that we're working with, that's exactly the approach, which is that, you know, you've got your HD map with its HD map layers, um, but they feel that they can't squeeze much more out of LiDAR and camera-based mapping. Uh, and the return on, you know, investment, so to speak, um, you know, is lower and lower and lower as you, as you cross more and more you know, technical um, uh, milestones. The introduction of something like GPR, which, which is totally uncorrelated from an independent of those map layers, is something that they view as a way of sort of instantly getting much more reliable overall performance. So, you know, if you're a company that has mastered, you know, a set of neighborhoods and you're starting to think about how do I scale this, you know, to the 20 largest metro areas uh, in the U.S., um, you start to think about, well, I need to have extremely high reliability to do that. Um, and yet, LiDAR and camera approaches are, are spent. How do I do that? And this is one way of doing it. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. It's, it's, it's finding... Yeah, patterns uh, that that again, as as humans, you know, we don't even know uh, are there. I want to um, uh, look at, at at another video here because I think this is where it starts to kind of we start to see a little bit more of the context. We see, uh, you know, the vehicle driving down the road. Uh, we see uh, sort of visualization of the of the radar uh, sending out its signals, and then we see sort of in a, in a, a different way, kind of a hybrid of the of the two images that we or visualizations that we'd seen previously of this data. Um, uh, and 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 so you can see underneath the road, there's this, there's this these patterns, right? That's right, and, th and this is real data you're looking at. And so you, you see these patterns, um, you're able to map them, uh, and then the next time you, you drive through, you're tracking to it. Um, and I think the most important thing to, to take away from this visualization is it really brings home that that data is consistent regardless of what's happening on the surface. And so. You know, there. You, what you see there is that that's just a new dimension, sort of a new a new line of sight, so to speak, um, that is totally decoupled from what's going on on the surface. Um, and that's really where the uh, you know, if you talk to the OEMs we're working with on the ADAS side or the L4 companies, that's really where the value proposition is coming in. Is it's 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 doing things that that other sensors can do, but in a way that's very very different than how they do. Yeah. So, and 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 here we can see, uh, you know, sort of a continuation of that of that um, uh, visualization, and and it's referencing something that that you just mentioned, which is regardless of what's going on on the surface of the road, right? Which, uh, depending on where you live, can change dramatically. And I think this is where we start to get into sort of understanding, um, sort of some of those unique capabilities that that you were talking about. Now, there are lots of ways that AVs. It's it. You know, I think, you know. Uh, certainly for, for uh, the most popular sort of early ways uh, that people understood about, about how to, you know, stay on the road, essentially, right? Localize, not within like a broader map, but just stay on the road, uh, was, was recognizing lines, right? And, and computer vision has, you know, been pretty good at being able to recognize lines. And, and there are other ways as well, of course, of, of, of staying on the road, for lack of a more technical way to, to, to phrase that problem. But, but, you know, when you start to think about Places where there's huge amounts of snow, of of ice, um, and, and you know certainly if you, if you if you're someone who's who's driven on a lot of roads like that, even as a human, it's it can be very difficult sometimes to know am I in the right lane here, or even in some cases, am I even on the road still? Um, so so I, I have to imagine uh, uh, you know snow and ice has got to be one of those uh, sort of operating challenges that that you know this technology is really poised to to potentially help out a lot on. That's right. That's right. I mean, it's easy to stare a customer and it's really hard to unstare them. And so, you know, if you think of even just taking the lane lines example, if you've got confusing or faded lane lines that cause, you know, the, um, the autonomous hands-free system to wobble a bit or get a little bit too close to um, traffic on, on one side or the other, you know, that unnerves the customer. Um, and obviously, you know, there are examples of, of it you know, resulting in, in fatal crashes as well. And so, um, 
moving away from sole reliance on lane markings as sort of a broad high level concept is, is an important sort of piece of the puzzle here um, with GPR saying, okay, I don't need to, you know, if, if I have conflicting signals on the lane, lane lines, um, I have another source to, to actually uh, determine what's going on. Uh, of course, as the automakers try to expand the actual OGD of a feature, they really want, you know, they know that their customers need it most when lane markings aren't clear or when driving conditions are challenging. So, you know, that runs to things like, is it snowing or raining? Do you maybe have faded lane markings? Are you in a hectic urban scenario um, where there's a lot going on? Um, and so as they look about, you know, look to build sort of the next generation of features, an increasingly software defined vehicle, um, this is very, very high on their list. Uh, and then you shift over to things like autonomous parking, something that is on pretty much every automaker's, you know, feature wish list. Um, where you get in the car and the car goes to, to one degree or another, um, parks itself and then, and then comes and picks you up. The lot environment and the garage environment are challenging visually um, to, to do localization in because you've got you know, a lot, a little highly dynamic, you know, a lot of cars moving, people moving, not a lot of fixed features. Uh, in the garage, you just have visual uniformity. So, you know, call them five meters, call them five meters and so on. Um, and so they're using GPR to solve localization in these types of environments to enable these types of features. Fascinating. And then, okay, so um, so it, it sounds like, I mean, there's applications in, in different kinds of driver assistance uh, and, and sort of automated features on, on cars people are going to buy. And then, of course, for, for fully autonomous vehicles on the ground, uh, you know, sort of ground up, uh, you know, autonomous uh, vehicles. Uh, you know, I think some people who, who pay uh, a little more attention to this world than, than maybe the, the average person on the street start to notice like, hey, uh, there are AVs on the road, right? They are, they are here in, in some places. Yeah. Uh, those places tend to be places that don't, don't get a lot of, of, of snow. Um, how, how big of a challenge is this for, for, for the fully autonomous vehicles? Yeah, it's tremendously challenging because what you need to safely uh, provide an autonomous vehicle product, an autonomous vehicle ride, is a, for, is a consistent environment around you that you can expect if I created the map at time zero and I'm driving through there at time one, the, the visual environment is going to look the same. Obviously, that is challenging to do um, for a whole host of different reasons, some of which are issues that happen in the moment, some of which are map degradation over time. Um, and so they are looking to GPR to provide that sort of bulletproof consistent map layer. Um, and so, and then that's true on the level four freight side where they're trying to build a business that's really premised on very high utilization. So, you know, the, the vehicle is running, uh, running its routes all the time, all the way through to the robo taxi side where, um, where, where they're saying, hey, we need a orthogonal uncorrelated input to make sure that we can provide a safe overall journey um, throughout the course of the ride. I sort of like to think of it as like if, you know, let's say uh, even if I, if I landed an SFO, I got out, got into the Uber, and the driver said, hey, I crash every time it snows out. And you think to yourself, hey, it's not going to snow. We're in, we're in San Francisco. Yeah. Um, uh, you might, that might cast a pall over the driver's overall confidence and ability. Uh, and that same dynamic is at play with AVs. You need to build an extraordinary level of uh, trust and comfort um, with the customer and um, making sure that you don't scare them uh, uh, because again it's, it's easy to scare and it's hard to unscare um, you know is a really big important piece on, I think the customer psychology at least from what we're hearing from from the L4 companies. Yeah absolutely and and you know I think from our uh, PAVE's sort of educational mission perspective I think you know one of the really uh, things that, that seems to really help people sort of understand this technology on a, in a in a basic way is is understanding that relationship between um, the operating domain, so ODD that you mentioned, the operating uh, operational design domain, uh, where the vehicle operates, and and the you know how how you have to develop the system for that, right? And and so a system um, that is able to operate somewhere where you're just not going to have to expect ice and snow, um, you know, you can have certain uh, uh, sensors and, and, and features and, and elements of that, of that stack, right? But then when you want to potentially take that to the next step, right, to, a, to an area where that stack is not going to be able to, as you said, 
perform to that really, really high standard that it's that it's going to be held to, you have to look for sort of what else what else can can you do? And so I think that relationship between the the operating domain and 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 what you need to have on the vehicle, and especially in terms of, of perception, um, is yeah. is a really good way for folks to start to kind of understand that that this is not like a one size fits all kind of technology, right? That this is at least where we are right now, uh, and we're still That's learning, right. like how you know if we want to keep expanding this these vehicles to more and more places, we're going to have to to look to things to solve some of these these other kinds of problems, right? That's right. We, we also think about it in, in, along a, another axis as well, which is the operating scale. So even if you're operating in San Francisco, um, if you're doing hundreds of thousands or millions of miles, you're, you're going to encounter stuff that you know, the, the traditional stack can't handle. And so that's what's dri driven, you know, quite frankly, a lot of interest is not even yet, like moving into New York City, obviously, you know, a big prize of a ride hailing market. Uh, is is great, but further down the roadmap, um, uh, our customers are thinking more about, okay, now I'm planning to drive millions of miles. Um, you know, we know the level of reliability needs to be extremely high. There's absolutely no tolerance, um, you know, as we've seen, and, and you know, rightly so, for, um, for accidents caused by AVs, especially fatal ones. Um, and so they're trying to think of how do I build that incredible reliability and safety to earn the public's trust um, uh, over time. It's a hard thing to do. You know, it's, uh, AVs have been described as sort of the, the, the greatest technical challenge of, of a generation for, uh, for a reason. Um, and it's building that reliability over a whole host of different types of scenarios that seem remote in any one person's mind, but given enough volume and enough scale to go back to operating scale, um, you know, become commonplace. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that is, uh, a really great great way uh, to just kind of think about about this whole sort of project of of, of driving automation and, and sort of the trajectory that it's on and and um, Tariq, I want I want to thank you for for taking the time today to to help us uh, not just understand ground, ground penetrating radar but but also you know these these lessons sort of about the technology more broadly that that sort of starting to understand uh, this this sensor and the unique capability it brings sort of you know unlocks so um, thank you so much for for your time and and for your your insight and, and for sharing it with our audience today. Yeah, thank you. It's been fun to chat. Yeah. And uh, Tariq Bolat is the CEO and co-founder of GPR, uh, and we've been discussing ground penetrating radar today. Um, uh, we hope you've enjoyed this conversation, uh, and we hope you uh, continue to come back to PAVE for more conversations like this about uh, all kinds of driving automation technology. Uh, thanks, and we'll see you here again next time.